Our story today comes to us indirectly by a Facebook friend of our, mine by the name of Matthew Roberts. I had never tried to tell his story, but I had a small part in it because I never really knew any of the details until Roberts posted his story on a private website. To tell you my part, I have to tell you, I have to give you an overview uh, of the uh, entire story he posted. This is about a man and his brother named Cochira, and it's talking about Cochira's gold. Back in 1942, an Apache Indian led a group of 14 men, or was part of a group of 14 men, in some cases identified as Apaches, in others just men, uh, into the superstitions uh, to Labarge Canyon at Squaw Box Canyon. They went up Squaw Box Canyon and, and uh, made a left turn and went up on a hilltop and found a a pit that they opened up and extracted approximately $50,000 in gold and then concealed the pit completely. Well, in 1962, this Kochira and his brother finally made a trip in there and spent several days looking for this pit and didn't find it. They were running low on surprise, uh, supplies and particularly water and they decided to leave to uh, resupply. And on the way out, they found a rotted pack saddle or a rotted leather bag of some kind. It didn't exactly identify what it was. And uh, it was full of gold ore. And they took that home back to Wisconsin, I believe it was, and had it assayed and it assayed out at $49,000 per ton. Well, that's pretty pretty good ore. It's, uh, it kind of works out to be about uh, a ton of, of uh, tailings uh, that tested at $49,000 uh, in 1960 would amount to about 1,420 ounces of gold at $35 an ounce. To give you a, a, a comparison to the Dutchman's gold, the Dutchman gold was assayed at 5,000 ounces per ton at $20 an ounce back in the 1890s. Anyway, as the story goes, the Kucheros were never able to come back and apparently he sent a letter to Crazy Jake of all people explaining to him the details and providing a map of the route that they took, the, the 1942 group took, and asked Crazy Jake to explore the area. Well, lots of people have been up on Peter's Mason, telling, including Walt Gassler, who we done a story on just recently. And he was working in the Peter's Mesa area, and uh, some very contemporary people have been up there, uh, Bob Corbin, the Attorney General, spent a couple of trips up there looking for, for Gassler's site. There's uh, uh, just a number of people that have spent time up there, including POCA, the, what is known as the POCA map, which was much older than this story and had some similarities in it. Anyway, I had been up there uh, at least once or twice in that area with Tom only we took a different route than it was described in the story. We kind of paralleled Labarge Canyon to the north of Squall Canyon, up a long, steep grade uh, to the top and dropped over into the other side of the hill. And, and uh, I forget what it was we specifically went to do. One of the things I remember about the trip, this was probably about 76, 77, was finding this spiral rock alongside a cliffside that had a perfect triangular opening into a cave. It wasn't really a very large cave. I went up in it, I was impressed by it. There's a lot of boulders on the small boulders on the floor that if you threw those out, you could make a very decent campsite that would hold uh, six to eight people and was very defensible. Nobody could get up there in there while you were there. 
I always kept that in the back of my mind for some reason. But anyway, on the way out, we ended up on the extreme west end of Peter's Mesa where this all supposed to have taken place. But I knew nothing about it at that time. And we run across, across a campsite there that had two tents, which put me in mind uh, of a military pup tent, you know, a two-man pup tent, but much larger. Each tent had two aluminum cots in it, and there was an aluminum lounge chair on the outside that was rotted away, and the, the tents had rips in them from the sun. They'd sit there and been exposed for a long time. This camp was obviously totally abandoned. Whoever packed it in there decided they weren't gonna go through the effort to pack it out and just left it and never came back. There was a metal tripod over a fire pit uh, that had a chain hanging on it and a, and a cast iron pot about this big around with a bale on it that was hooked to the chain. And in the bottom was about two inches of dried beans with mold on them. They'd been there a long time and uh, never, never got off the horse to look inside the tent to see what was might else be in there. We just left it and exited our way out. And we, Tom, we went a different route to get out. And there was a, a pretty scary descent coming off that west end of Peter's Mesa. And anyway, uh, I don't know exactly where they found this leather, I'm gonna call it a saddlebag, but um, you know, I'm gonna tell you my part in this story, which happened uh, after 1990. The museum at Goldfield for the Superstition Mountain Museum opened in January of 1990. And sometime after 1990, but certainly between 90 and 93, uh, I need to back up a little. The story did say that uh, a, a stable owner in the area ended up with some of this Cochera's gold. And he came in, this same saddle owner, and the story didn't name him, so I'm not going to name him, but I think everybody knows who it was. He came into the museum and offered to put a piece of Kachira's gold on display, uh, on loan. So I put the, the Kachira's gold right next to all the samples of ore from every mine that's in the Superstition Mountain Goldfield Mining District. That display is still on display at the museum today. And next to it was an eight by 10 picture of um, the matchbox, the Dutchman's matchbox. Now I had plenty of time to go over on that uh, uh, piece of Kachira's gold was put on loan. I had plenty of time to go over and look at all the specimens that uh, from all the mines in the Goldfield area and the vulture mine as well because many people claim that the Dutchman high graded the ore out of the vulture mine so a sample of that was there. Uh, I have seen the matchbox in real uh, and handled it one time myself and the picture of it was a very good picture. And just comparing all these things to me, it, um, and let me add, but I only had a piece about this big, but I saw a video that this um, uh, stable owner was in where he, he had a piece of it in the palm of his hand showing somebody. You couldn't see it very well, but it was palm size. And I never, he, he claimed that he had bought the last six pieces of Kachira's gold. And to be fair, I never saw the other five pieces. I only saw this piece this big. But it didn't take a rocket scientist, in my opinion, to, to look at the matrix of, of the ore that was involved with all these uh, samples to say that the Dutchman gold was totally dissimilar to any of it. And least of all was that piece of Kachira's gold. And I was under the impressions, I don't know if it was a stable owner that told me this or somebody else, that the pack saddle with the ore in it was found partially concealed under some brush and stuff somewhere near first first water uh, parking lot and uh, that's not what the story uh, said and it's one of the reasons I never attempted to tell this story until 
Mr. Roberts came out with it and I could see all this detail. So anyway, uh, uh, approximately a year later, a man came into the museum and demanded that I give him back that piece of gold that the stable owner had given us on loan and claimed it was his. I said, well, you're not the guy that brought it in here and put it on loan. I'm not going to give you that sample, you know. And uh, he didn't put up much of an argument and left. And uh, some time later, uh, you know, I was running the museum on a daily basis, but then we begin to get volunteers and stuff. And sometimes later, a volunteer was running the museum on a daily basis. And uh, a year or so later, I ended up back on a daily basis running the museum and the stable owner come in wanting to know what happened to that piece of Gochira's gold that he put on display. And I wasn't even aware, I'd just come back, I wasn't even aware it was missing. And I went over and looked in the case and sure enough, it wasn't there. And my first thought was, was uh, well, the volunteer didn't know anything about this, so did that guy come back and convince him to cough up the gold? Or did he take it? What, what happened to that piece of gold? Well, you know, I, there's another story I want to throw in here. Um, in 1863, and I was told this story by a person I have great respect for and is certainly one of the most honest men I ever knew. And, uh, but I, I have not been able to find any verification of this story, but it, it is a good story. In 1863, a troop of cavalry made a camp over in Weeks Wash, uh, near where uh, Weeks Ranch would have been located in later years. And that's just across the street from the current location of the Superstition Mountain Museum. And there were scouts out, and one of the scouts came in and reported that he'd found uh, skeleton, human skeletal remains up on the slopes of uh, Superstition. So the next day they rode up there and found, according to the story, found four human skeleton remains uh, right up against the, the mountainside. Um, and many people would say this was the area where the 1848 Peralta massacre took place. But it was much further around from the what everybody believes was a massacre site and was closer to the Palmer Mine. Indeed, in 1912, a guy named Carl Silverlock reportedly found $18,000 worth of gold ore right there in this spot uh, near Palmer's Mine. Anyway, the, the cavalry uh, and searching these skeletons were pretty much in the same place, but working their way northward, they found the skeleton that had apparently been mortally wounded and had crawled up under some brush and the Apaches or whoever was involved in this massacre uh, evidently missed his body. All the other skeletons had no clothing, no way to identify him in any way, shape or form. Apparently they had taken all their boots and clothing and accoutrements, uh, but this one skeleton still had some clothing on it. And either by the clothing or in one case of the story, uh, this one of the skulls had a gold tooth in it. And it certainly showed that it was not Indians that uh, had, been, had been killed there. And they assumed that this was uh, uh, Mexicans uh, or possibly white people. But back in the 60s, there was not a very many white people in the Valley of the Sun here. Uh, in fact, the first white, ch white child was born in Phoenix in 1875, uh, belonging to Matt Cabanis. So anyway, as, as they continued searching, they kept finding uh, some skeleton remains working to the northeast past uh, First Water, uh, clear down to what we call Brush Corral. And Brush Corral is very close to the entrance of West Boulder, East Boulder Canyon, where Blacktop Mesa is. 
And this is only a blacktop mesa as you going up Bull Pass to go up on top of Blacktop Mesa. It's only about a mile and a half from Squaw Canyon. So my question is, is uh, the story never said anything about the 14 man expedition losing anything or losing any men or anything. And they just, Cochiras just stumbled across this on leaving uh, Peter's Mesa to, to, to leave the, the mountains. So who lost this pack? Well, this story about the cavalry being in there finding, and if I remember right, it was either 12 or 14 skeletons total that had been found. The last one they went to was at this brush corral area. And uh, to go any further into the mountains, it was gonna get into some really rough terrain. So they probably didn't go any further, but this indicated to them that this was a running gun battle that was coming out of the mountains, uh, leaving casualties all the way up to where they found the, the five skeletons. And is this where the rotted pack panyard came from? You know, what, uh, what about the, the, the burls that were carrying this stuff? During a gunfight, they would take off in every direction. Did, did a couple of them run back into the mountains and, and lose their panyards or whatever you have? It's just, <laughs> this whole thing is just another mystery of the Superstition Mountain. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.